right. Well, thank you everybody so much for coming out tonight. I am Tanya Daniels. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications. And I just would like to say how humbled we are that all of you came out for this. Um, recently, we discussed a additional engagement tool for Facebook Live being offered whenever we do a magazine. And we did this magazine that just hit homes this weekend. This magazine is three times the content of a typical magazine that we do. So we thought it was simply apropos that our first Facebook Live wasn't just Facebook Live, it was YouTube Live, live on the city's website live on the city's television channel, and brought to you from the Colony Theater <laughs> with this esteemed panel. So we appreciate that. We also appreciate that in a recent survey, 59% of our residents said that where they get the information about the city is from this magazine. For that, we are humbled, and we are grateful for your readership, and we are very proud of this fully recyclable magazine. So what we're gonna talk about here today is a little bit of details on the resilience efforts that we're doing as a city. So they're gonna go through a few questions and then they're gonna, the mayor's gonna pull some questions that you submitted either online or out in the lobby when you got here. And then I'd like to introduce our panel. With us right here, we have Susie Torrienti. She is our Chief Resilience Officer and city, Assistant City Manager. We have Eric Carpenter, Assistant City Manager our esteemed city manager, Jimmy Morales, and our moderator this evening is the esteemed Mayor Dan Gelber. Mayor, I turn it over to you if you'd like to say some things before you start, if you'd like to just start right in with your questions, completely up to you. But thank you all very much for being here. I thought I'd sing. Thank you. And um, thank you to all the city staff that put this together uh, and who are participating today. Um, it's a wonderful thing. And my phone is going off and it has the Game of Thrones um, song, which I don't think I should be playing in public. I don't want to ruin the end. Arya does very well. Okay, let's, um, you know, our city's uh, efforts on resiliency and sea level rise are really significant. I think it's important for people to really have every possibility to ask questions, to confront us, to uh, kick the tires, to look under the hood. And uh, simply because it's your community, it's your most uh, valuable asset, it's the thing you love and it's the thing you own, and it's the, the place you spend the most time. So it's really important to us that you feel like that your questions are answered. Uh, today's effort is really, I'm gonna ask some questions of the people most responsible for the resiliency program in our city. Then I'm gonna take questions that you all have asked in this box. I'll draw them out randomly. Um, but at the end of the day, we want you to feel like you know what's going on. I can't tell you how important it is. You may not like always what you hear, but as residents of this community, you have a right, 100% right, to be listened to and to be talked to about what's going on uh, outside your home and in the community you love. So we appreciate your interest and anyone uh, listening or watching us uh, wherever this is being shown on the internets. Uh, thank you, and, and we'll get started. Uh, Jimmy, you're the city manager. So everything that you're responsible for, the good stuff I take responsibility for, the bad stuff you take responsibility for. Um, but it isn't something that just started in the last couple of years. You've been uh, working on this since uh, 2013 when you started. So why don't you give us, just cue us up to what the program has been on a macro level so people can sort of understand if they don't uh, where we are uh, from where we've been. Okay, turn the microphone off of that. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming tonight, and those who are watching or listening, as the case may be. Uh, Mayor, you're correct. This has been going on for a few years. And candidly, I want to acknowledge that the, this effort predates my coming on board in 2013. Um, I invite you all, actually, if you have a magazine uh, or when you get it, there's actually a wonderful resilience timeline in the magazine. Uh, it's not quite a centerfold, but it's a uh, uh, fold-out that gives you a real uh, chronology of the efforts this city's been taking. You know, it was in 2012 when this city adopted a stormwater management plan that incorporated for the first time sea level rise into the stormwater plan, and I think making it one of the first cities in America to actually do that. That same year, the city joined the Four County Climate Change Compact, which has really been a regional leader on this issue and actually recognized nationally in its efforts, and we'll talk about more of that in a second. Um, the following year, was really when things began to take off. You all remember June of 2013, I believe it was, Rolling Stone magazine, Miami drowning, and all of a sudden we became 
the poster child for, for this initiative. That sparked the creation, if you recall, of a flood committee that then uh, morphed into a blue ribbon panel on flooding uh, that began to change the conversation. We hired a, an outside consultant, ACOM, to really fortify our stormwater plan. The plan adopted in 2012 incorporated sea level rise, but given particularly the, the tough economic times the city was coming out of, not as at robust a level because of the costs associated with that. Uh, we began to look at those assumptions. To that, the uh, fall of 2013, if you remember, we had a, a really significant king tide that really created a political leverage going to 2014 where we really began to up our efforts. Um, the work of ACOM done during that time, the blue ribbon panel beginning to change our assumptions for things like the, the height of seawalls and whatnot. Uh, in the September of 2015, we became, I believe, the first Florida city, if not the first among the first, to actually create a chief resiliency position. Uh, we hired Susie uh, and uh, provided leadership there and, and have done great work. In March of 2016, we actually updated a lot of our regional sea level projections because the Climate uh, Change Compact came out with very aggressive projections because what we had seen for years was the sea level rise actually was usually exceeding the projection. So we needed to make sure that if we were going to try to have a resilient stormwater management plan, we adopted aggressive uh, projections. That ultimately resulted in 2016 in a significant reissuing of the master plan that led to some of the road raising and other issues that I know have been uh, heavily discussed in the community. While we were doing that, we also were not just talking about gray infrastructure. We wanted to look at the green. In 2016, we adopted our new green building ordinance, which really tried to bring some of these principles into the private sector construction. And that ordinance, as I remember, actually was a, won a state award uh, for planning. In May of 16, we were selected as one of the 100 resilient cities with Miami-Dade County and, and um, City of Miami. And I know uh, the county CRO, uh, Jim Murley, is here somewhere. I saw him walk in earlier. Uh, fast forward a little bit. We had uh, in late, uh, in 2016, 17, we went through a process with ULI. Uh, that when uh, the mayor came in, he wanted a, a, the red team, was it, to take a look at what we were doing, uh, kick the tires and make sure, given the fact that we had a significant high cost plan and a lot of work, that we were doing the right things. ULI came in, really did a wonderful analysis of what we were doing, uh, verified a lot of the good stuff we were doing and had came up with a lot of great suggestions on other things we could do. Um, uh, part of that ultimately resulted through uh, also the support of the 100RC, the Columbia University Accelerator, where we looked specifically at the West Avenue plan, uh, plan uh, made some changes, changed orders to that plan. That prior plan, which had not really had significant community support on West Avenue, suddenly had, and, and that uh, plan and process uh, really have also educated going forward. And now coming out of the ULI analysis and the new political leadership, uh, we've hired Jacobs Consulting, and they're working on really redoing our master plan to not just incorporate the gray infrastructure pieces, but to really incorporate the green infrastructure, the blue infrastructure, and recognize that it needed to be an integrated stormwater management plan that was not just about making us resilient vis-a-vis -vis, uh, sea level rise, stormwater, et cetera, but also placemaking, creating great neighborhoods uh, that uh, were not only resilient, but also wonderful places to live. And also we should point out, I wanted to point out, that these resiliency plans were not just about stormwater, but also as we were redoing our infrastructure, also critical water and sanitary sewer infrastructure, which was uh, in many parts of the city was underinvested in for many, many years. And as we do these neighborhoods, we will also become resilient uh, in those areas. So uh, there's a lot more detail in your magazine. I'd encourage you to read it, but that gives you sort of a sense of uh, how we've progressed over time. Thank you. Um, you know, I think if I had a, uh, with the easiest uh, poll star to say what was going on, at the beginning, there was a big push to get it done. And I think what we really are trying to do now is get it done right. Uh, and that's why we're bringing in some of these other experts, because I think you sort of change your views. If you can't inform your program with the best uh, information available, you're, I think you're doing a disservice, and you shouldn't be afraid to second-guess yourselves, frankly, because information changes, technology advances, and, and in order to not waste money, and to not waste the disruption that people uh, might have to endure. We ought to make sure we're doing it the right way. And that brings me to my question to Susie Triente. Um, we're a member of the Southeast Florida Climate Change Compact. So why don't you explain what that organization does? Because a lot of people may not understand why we're in these compacts with other counties and other, other places that are having the same kind of challenges we are. 
Sure, Mayor, thank you and um, welcome and good evening everyone. Um, I love talking about the compact. It's actually one of the highlights of my career. And it started in 2009 when I was still with Miami-Dade County. And I remember uh, being up in, in Washington, D.C. with different delegations walking through the halls of, of Congress talking to the different members. And we were talking and, and about how do we get money down here to deal with climate adaptation. And every uh, municipality and county that was there was walking in with a different package and with different projections. And we all had different stories. And every time we briefed a member and came back into the hallway, you know, they just seemed more confused. It seemed like we didn't have our act together. And so we came back to, to South Florida and said, why don't we start to really collaborate in these issues that are so in incredibly complex? And we decided to create this Southeast Florida Climate Compact. And that's essentially um, an agreement. It's a resolution that was approved by the four counties, Broward, uh, Palm Beach, Miami-Dade, and Monroe. And what we said was these four counties are coming together, they approved a resolution and said, we're gonna work and we're gonna collaborate. We're gonna share information on climate adaptation and climate mitigation. And it's a very simple document, but it's given us a lot of you know, really leeway to do a lot of really interesting work together. Uh, the, the compact said we were gonna do a greenhouse gas uh, baseline inventory for the region. We were gonna come up with unified sea level rise projections for the region. We would do yearly uh, policy statements to speak to Tallahassee and to DC with one, one voice, the power of you know, more than six million people in our area. We agreed to do um, month, uh, uh, sorry, um, annual workshops uh, and, and, and summits, and we've been doing that. We just hosted the last one uh, here in Miami Beach uh, last year, and there was more than 700 people attending. And, and then we host uh, regional workshops so that we can arm the staffs and all the different cities with the best available information like the mayor mentioned. Uh, just two weeks ago, we did an interesting workshop on the power of purchasing and procurement and how to take information that we've gathered and actually put it in our procurement processes to really accelerate um, the work that we're doing. So uh, what I wanted to mention was that Miami Beach became a member, as, as the manager alluded to, um, in the compact um, in 2012. In 2011, I left Miami-Dade County, I went to Fort Lauderdale, but I didn't want to leave the compact. And I knew that there was value in cities being involved because cities are in fact the front lines. And the first regional climate action plan actually talked about that, that it would be a, a broad menu of recommendations for the whole region from Palm Beach to Monroe, but the work would be happening in the cities. But the support and the backing and the collaboration came from, from the support of the counties and the work that they're doing. And one of the more, most important early tools that the compact came up with was these unified sea level rise projections to deal with this little problem that we had in DC that we were a bit scattered. And um, the, the, the unified sea level rise projections for the region are based on the international IPCC. They're based on the Army Corps of Engineers. But we like to say that we took the best and the brightest engineers and academics and hydrologists and geologists and all sorts of people, you know, like with Eric's background and, you know, the smart people stuck them in the room, closed the door, locked them up and said, don't come out until you give us a tool that we can work with. And we came up with the, the unified sea level rise projections in uh, 2012. They were updated in 2015. And now they're gonna be updated this year in 2019. And, and what that does is that it gives folks like us, you know, planners, engineers, city managers, the ability to look at what infrastructure are we going to build and how do we look at that infrastructure differently in terms of the future. Um, I was talking to my deputy earlier today and we were saying, um, if you know, 20 years ago, if you wanted to build a fire station, you, know, you built a fire station because it was probably at the end of its useful life, and you needed a fire station because it needed to have a good um, you know, response time, right? And the fire chief is in the audience, actually. Um, but nowadays, we have to build the fire station not only to deal with the response time and to you know, make sure that, that the asset stays you know, for as long as it can, but if we look at it in the terms of sea level rise and reducing our risk, we're probably going to build that fire station differently. And we may buy, you know, build it at a different elevation or maybe the, 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 the way we designed it and the inside is different. So what the compact does with tools like this, it gives us um, ways of thinking differently. 
and training our staff to think differently, not to build for the past, but to build for the future. So I'll just share that for right now, the projections for sea level rise for Southeast Florida in the short term, which is by 2030, we expect six to 10 inches above the 1992 uh, mean sea level. Uh, medium term, which is about 2060, the level is projected to be 14 to 34 inches above 1992. And then the long term, uh, 2100, the, pro uh, the projected rise is 31 to 81 inches. And again, there's, there's variation there. So de depending on what you're building and where you're building it, again, people like Eric and his team of engineers can use this data to help the thinking process, if you will, and to help think how are we going to do things in the future to invest in our city, to adapt to climate change, and to reduce risk. Thanks, Susie. You know, Eric, um, talking, uh, Susie's talking about sort of what we're doing in these projections, but I'd like you to bring it a little bit more earthier for everybody and really explain to us how we determine the actual standards for road elevation. How many years are we planning for? Are we creating basements in this city where there were never really were basements? Because I think people really want to know, um, and there's a lot of aspects to the resiliency effort, but the road raising is the one that really has people the most obviously uh, concerned, certainly because of street harmonizations, but also because it's a major change. So why don't, tell us like, if we do all this, how long is it, are we gonna do it for? When are we gonna have to change it again? And how we actually came to these, these uh, units of measurement and, and use inches better than anything else, because I think people understand that better than uh, the other measurements that are often used. Fair enough. And, um there's a lot to the discussion about how do we adapt to sea level rise and climate change. Um, Susie mentioned uh, a lot of the great work that the Climate Compact has done, and we're using that to inform our decision-making process. Uh, when I first got here, the challenge was we had a stormwater master plan that had taken into account sea level rise, but they were balancing that against mean sea level as opposed to a maximum sea level during king tide events, that can be greater than a foot differential. Uh, one of the things that we're always looking at is how do we design a city that we would like to live in? How do we measure you know, the inconvenience of flooding days? Um, I lived on Miami Beach for almost 12 years on Belle Isle, and I can't tell you how many times I drove through a huge standing water puddle at the corner of Purdy and Dade because that was such a low-lying road, and during tidal events, during rainfall events, it would just accumulate water there to the point that I actually had to retire a car early because of the corrosion of the undercarriage of the car due to the salt water. So when we looked at how do we adapt, how do we make this a better city, we said, well, what are our maximum tidal events that we're seeing? And then what are our sea level rise projections that we should be looking at um, planning for? And we said, well, on a 30-year planning horizon, which is about the lifetime of a typical road before you would have to come in and reconstruct again, um, we can deal with a incremental adaptation and then at the end of that 30 year cycle, we can sit back and take a look and say, do we need to do a next round of incremental adaptation or is there technology that's gonna come forward in that time period and hopefully lessen the impacts of sea level rise here in Miami Beach um, so we looked at, on a 30-year horizon, we need to build a foot of additional adaptation ability or elevation to our existing roads above our max tidal events. And then you put on top of that that roads, like most building materials, don't do very well when they're submerged in water on a regular basis. And so your road surface your, your bedding material, their foundation for the road really does need to stay above that water elevation. So what we end up with is a road that really should be 
two feet above the max tidal event to incorporate a foot of sea level rise and the ability for that structure of the road to be maintained for its 30 year life cycle. Uh, as a result, we ended up with this number of 3.7 uh, NAVD, a lot of people get confused that that means we're raising the road by 3.7 feet. That's not the case. Most of the roads here in Miami Beach are anywhere between two to six feet um, NAVD. So in most cases, you're talking about a six or a 12 inch elevation difference. In some extreme cases, like in Sunset Harbor, we had to actually raise the road more than two feet in some locations. That's not the norm. That's not what we're doing across the board. Um, and Sunset Harbor was also extremely challenging because we had very narrow right-of-ways and we had buildings that were built right to the right-of-way line, which left us very little room to harmonize between the crown of road elevation and the adjacent properties. Um, so. We took a lot of what we've learned in Sunset Harbor. We're applying that in the other neighborhoods. Um, I will tell you that uh, a neighborhood like Sunset Harbor, when I lived in Miami Beach, it used to flood three, four times a year from tidal events, and it would flood another three or four times a year from rainfall events. So there was a significant impact to that flooding in that neighborhood. Um, I can very comfortably say that we've averted at least two dozen t tidal flooding events in Sunset Harbor since that neighborhood was reconstructed. And we've done significantly better on rainfall events, not quite exactly where we wanna be yet, but we're getting there. Um, and what I will say is, you know, I've heard the basement line brought up in many different conversations. Uh, very simple. The FEMA flood insurance program, the National Flood Insurance Program, defines a basement as being a floor, a habitable floor in a building that is lower than the adjacent grade on all four sides. There are no buildings in Miami Beach that have basements under that definition, even after the roads are raised, that doesn't designate those businesses or those properties as basements. Unfortunately, you know, insurance companies are not in the business to pay claims. They're in the business to try to make money. As a result, you know, a very uh, zealous insurance adjuster decided they were going to try and hang their hat on that definition. Um, thankfully, we were able to uh, work with the business owner and the insurance company and the National Flood Insurance Program and prove that they were incorrect and that claim has been paid. Thank you. So, J Jimmy, um, you know, you, I get a lot. I don't live in Purdy. I live somewhere else where there's no flooding. So why am I going to have to endure this? Why, why me? Uh, I hear from residents. And they really are sincerely wondering why, if there's not an issue right now of flooding that uh, we've got to raise a road a few inches or more or we have to and, and we have to deal with the harmonization issues so answer that for the folks that have, that might be asking that no that's the most challenging issue you know one of the things that the urban line institute talked about was how do you keep a sense of urgency and it was easy in, the, in neighborhoods where people were in fact living with water and it's more challenging with folks who aren't seeing it at that same level um, there's a couple things that are, that are important to keep in mind number one i mentioned earlier these neighborhood projects are not just about stormwater. They're also about aging infrastructure like uh, water and sewer and, and placemaking. So, and some of the neighborhoods, in fact, and I'm sure Eric could say, there are neighborhoods that have critical issues today on water and sanitary sewer that have to move forward. And so part of it is if we're going to do that and open up the ground and whatnot, we might as well address those issues as well. So that's one of the arguments we have. We don't want to have to come back again and do it. Number two, one of the interesting questions, you know, uh, uh, Susie, I think, was mentioning that you know, our statistics, uh, the projections are in by 2060, it could be as high as 34 inches. That's almost three feet. And I think a lot of times people visualize it as, uh, and then this, right? I can, in, in year 2060, suddenly the water will rise by three feet. But what we know is it's not. It's, it's, an, it's, in, it's incremental. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's a little steeper slope 
than we expected. What that means is, and we actually have, I think, programs that can show people for their properties individually, over, as the years go by, you're gonna be more and more often impacted by those sunny day floodings, by those king tide floods, or you know, a king tide flood together with the rain. So while you may think, well, I'm not gonna see that three feet till 2060, you might in five years start to see a lot more water. You know, Eric mentioned, I think in 2017 and 2018 alone, we had 21 king tides uh, that were higher than the one in 2013, which was horrible in, in Sunset Harbor. That's just in those two years, that would have been 21 occasions where just three or four years later, Sunset Harbor was gonna be even worsely impacted. So the, the issue is you don't wanna wait till it's too late. It gets much more expensive. And if we're gonna be doing the work anyway, we really need to get the properties resilient. Because the other thing we're fighting, and I think this is the third point, there's a market out there of media and others, uh, and even some academics and others who wanna say, we're still drowning. And, and that can impact your property values, and that can impact your insurance. And I think as we saw with our recent bonds, where Wall Street looked at it and actually gave us kudos and kept our high ratings because in fact we're one of the most aggressive cities in dealing with this. So I think it's also a way to make sure we're protecting all of our investments, commercial and, and, and residential, and the city's investments uh, by setting the standard, not being seen as a victim of, of sea level rise and, and uh, climate change, but in fact as a city who's leading the way in, in getting things done. Yeah, and by the way, um, because the bond uh, were rated so high and the demand was so great, they lowered the interest rate on what people would make from them. And the result was that uh, in the first tranche of our geo bonds, I think we saved $28 million or something like that on the 130 or whatever was in the there first. There out there somewhere. So I know John could tell us that, but that's pretty amazing. And people wonder about the bottom line. You know, that's an example of it. Okay, Eric, I get emails all the time and people go on the internet and they see things and some people have said to me, how did you pick the pump system? We're switching from a gravitational system to a pump system. Why not have those deep well injections uh, that we hear about? Why are we using stormwater uh, pump stations, the ones that we're using? Explain that technology from an engineering point of view so people understand what the city was thinking when it made that decision. And, and sure, and there are a lot of facets to that conversation. Um, I wanna start out the conversation by saying that we're open to any technology that will help keep our streets dry and keep our bay clean. Uh, those are our two primary objectives. Um, we've looked at a lot of different technologies. We've looked at you know, increasing uh, the gravity flow. We're, we've looked at um, incorporating shallow injection wells. We've looked at incorporating deep injection wells. Um, I think a lot of times folks get a little bit confused when you're talking shallow injection wells versus deep injection wells. Um, just to give everybody a, a little bit of a concept, shallow wells are typically wells that are anywhere from 60 to 100 feet deep. Um, deep injection wells, which we've heard talked about quite frequently recently, um, are actually three to 5,000 feet deep. Um, and in most cases, these wells are only about 24 inches in diameter. Uh, those are about the largest that you, can, that you can build. And you have a real challenge with disposing of water by pumping it down into the ground at the same rate of speed that you would be able to discharge that water at grade. Um, there is a significant need in our city because we're so flat. I mean, Miami Beach was basically built out of the Atlantic Ocean and Biscayne Bay, with the exception of the coastal ridge, um, we're, we're a mangrove swamp that was filled. And, and so we're very low elevation in relation to our surrounding water bodies. The challenge with that is we're also built on a very porous subsurface material that interconnects the ocean and the bay and the groundwater table underneath our city. So if the tide is high in the bay and in the ocean, the groundwater underneath the city is also extremely high. So what happens is there are limits on how much pressure you can put on wells pushing water into the ground because you don't want to create sinkholes, um, you don't want to create void spaces underneath the ground, 
um, that will lead to long-term problems. So you have limits on how much pressure you can put on a well to pump it down. As a result, you have limits on how much water you can dispose via wells. And then you have the problem with the shallow wells of there are over 400 shallow wells currently in South Beach. Each of those wells is trying to pump the water into the very same aquifer, the same strata. And so each of them pressurizes the system and builds a mound of pressure around the well that starts to influence the wells surrounding it. So when you need those wells to perform the most, that's when they are restricted in their capacity to be able to handle water the most, and you find that you have the least amount of success in disposing of water in a quick manner. Um, deep injection wells don't quite have as much of a problem with disposing of the water in, in competing fashion because there aren't that many deep wells. As a matter of fact, there are no cities in the state of Florida that use deep well injection for stormwater um, management because it's extremely difficult to install those deep wells. It's expensive to both install them and then to maintain them, and you end up having to run your pumps at much, much higher pressures to push the water down into those deep wells ultimately resulting in higher costs of maintaining the equipment, larger infrastructure having to run the pumps, and you end up with very large pump housing structures. Um, uh, the only folks that are currently using deep well in Miami-Dade County are Miami-Dade Water and Sewer, who are doing it at their South Dade uh, treatment facility, and they're pumping into the ground, um, you know, a couple million gallons a day, which are about our peak flows for some of our larger pump stations. And they have a pump house that's probably a little bit bigger than this stage and about 20 to 25 feet high um, that they need to build around those pumps to be able to make that work. That's extremely challenging in a space constrained environment like we have here in Miami Beach. Thank you. Um, so Susie, we've talking about uh, resiliency really as it relates to sea level rise and sort of the flooding. You know, you're the chief resiliency officer, which isn't just a single scope. It's not just one area. Why don't you ex explain what other elements we are involved in that sort of uh, mission? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, in, in Miami Beach, a lot of times people will say our resilience program, and it's really our stormwater program. And, and it's one important element in making sure that we are doing all we can to reduce our risk. And, and that's what resilience is. Resilience is basically and simply uh, what are the things that um, a city, uh, an organization, a community, a person can do to bounce back quickly when something stressful happens, whether it's a shock like a hurricane or uh, an economic downturn. It could be major infrastructure failure. Th those are shocks, right? Um, Zika came to us as a shock a few years ago, but then it's become more of a stress, something that we deal with sort of those, those gnawing day-to-day -day issues. Um, our stresses are things like affordable housing issues, um, mobility, transportation, things like that. And so much like the compact has given us the ability to work with partners throughout the region, uh, the four counties, the more than 100 cities. The, um, the, the compact helps us uh, share information and realize that we're not alone in, in the climate um, situation. But uh, three years ago, we were chosen, and I think the manager mentioned earlier, we were chosen to be a partner in the 100 Resilient Cities Network, pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation. And when I say we, it's a very unique uh, partnership with Miami-Dade County and the city of Miami. We're the, actually the only organization that's a two cities and a county in the 100 Resilience Network. And it's a global network, and it's cities all around the world dealing with issues of, of urbanization, globalization, and, and climate change. And we're talking today about Miami Beach, we're talking about the risks 
and our vulnerabilities and the things that we're doing to, to combat them. But what partnerships like the Compact and 100RC tell us that we're not alone. We're not the only ones dealing with these complex issues. And so by working together, we can learn from these different networks and bring home different solutions that fit us, that fit our you know, small, dense, um, you know, flat and flatter um, island. So um, I did want to preview, and I know that Jim Murley's in the audience, that we've been working together over the last three years. Uh, we've been talking to the community. We've been out in all different areas of Miami-Dade Day County. And on Thursday, on Thursday morning, on, on May 30th, we are going to be unveiling our uh, resilient 305 strategy. And that is to deal with not only climate change, but also the broader resilience issues. Um, I'll tease it and, and share that we'll be talking about um, three different goal areas. It's places. It's uh, ad ad uh, addressing the place-based challenges that we have, um, the vulnerabilities obviously surrounding water. Uh, the third, the second um, kind of goal area is people, because we really want to improve the lives of each individual. You can't be a resilient city if you don't have resilient people and families and neighborhoods um, and, and, and just the, the different, um, the, the building blocks of a community. And then the third is pathways. And pathways is really the way to get there. How are we going to make the connection and do the paths to make sure that our people and our places are resilient, that we do uh, bounce back when something happens, when we, when we, when that next storm comes or when that next flooding situation comes, we're not going to necessarily fix these problems, you know, and I think it's important to say that. Um, the climate solution is not a, a fix. The climate solution is this ongoing incremental adaptation where we learn and adapt and we're nimble and we learn and adapt. And instead of having 21 days of flooding, we can have maybe two days of flooding or instead of 48 hours of flooding, we can have two hours of flooding. And it's managing the complexity of our problem, of everybody's problem. So what we're, we're learning from our different networks. We're learning to be resilient as a whole, as a community. And I think that we are learning to also adapt and to live in a changing world. Thank you. I want to take a moment to acknowledge my commissioner, John uh, Aliman. Commissioner John Aliman is here. Raise your hand and say hello. Thank you for coming. Um, Last question before you go to some of the audience or the web questions. Um, you know, you talked about sort of rain events and less flooding. We had a, a rain event a couple weeks ago, and Eric or Jimmy, maybe you can answer this. And there were rumors that the pumps weren't working because there was some, some water uh, collection. Can you, can you talk about that since I'm pretty certain you got a lot of the calls and then they went right over to Eric? Yeah, I can, I can certainly address that. Um, I'm pleased to report that during the rainfall event that we had a couple weeks ago, although we got a tremendous amount of rain in a very short period of time, um, you know, we got our typical month of May in the last 30 years is about five and a quarter inches. We saw an inch and three quarters in 30 minutes um, a few weeks back. And our pumps were all operational. They were pumping as fast as they could. They moved over an Olympic-sized swimming pool of water out of Sunset Harbor's neighborhood uh, in that 30-minute cycle. Um, and although there was a period where the rain was falling faster than the pumps could keep up, it was quickly, um, the pumps were able to catch up after the rain slowed a little bit and the neighborhood was able to dry out much, much quicker than it would have otherwise. Thank you. Anyway, a, yeah. a couple observations on, on that and some of the emails and stuff. Number one, I think it's important to note, I think someone mentioned, and maybe it was you, Mayor, that we, we learn as we go along. And, and when we uh, designed the system, I think, because Sunset Harbor really was our first one, we were really hyper-focused on uh, the sea level rise issue because of the sunny day flooding. And I think we went with our traditional assumptions about uh, rainfall. And what we've seen is, uh, you know, another aspect of, climate change or, or, or whatnot is uh, that our, our rain frequency and intensities have changed. I mean, Houston has had two 500-year storms in the last four years. So clearly, you know, the 10-year storm has become the five-year storm, the 25. And, and so I know we have made adjustments going forward. And I know 
We have gone back to Sunset and made some readjustments there to acknowledge that we, we probably needed to have designed and, and, and are making modifications to address greater intensity of storms. That, that's one point. Number two, I remember seeing some emails and some pictures posted of, you know, uh, standing water on the golf course or standing water on the, what will soon be the, hopefully the convention center park that was just a dirt field or, or water in someone's fr front yard. You know, an important concept we talk about is living with water. Um, that's what those areas are supposed to do. Green space is supposed to be where you have water retention to allow it to naturally flow through. No stormwater system is going to guarantee that the green spaces will be bone dry. I mean, that's how you want nature to work, and that's why as we create an integrated stormwater plan and with green and blue, the green is, in fact, to have more green areas, like a new five-acre park or a new three-acre park on West Avenue that can, in fact, hold water as opposed to letting it just flow into the street. And the third aspect, and this is really critical, uh, and what we see in Sunset Harbor, the, the, the businesses that had some challenges this time are the businesses that had challenges, really, most of them, over the last two or three years when we've had some problems, and they're businesses that are one, two, three, four feet below flood grade. We cannot in the long term, no system we're going to design is going to keep those businesses from flooding when, because by the time the pumps turn on, they've already seen a, a fair amount of flooding in their courtyard. Long term, the private businesses need to become compliant. They need to figure out either through adjustments of their building or their business practices or their interiors, if they're not going to elevate, then how to deal with that rainfall. And, we're, and we hopefully, for those who are out there, we're willing to work with you to identify those. So oftentimes tenants move in, they don't realize that what used to be a warehouse or a garage that they're in with their store or their beauty parlor or their whatever really is going to be, uh, have the risk of flooding uh, unless they also take some steps and we're happy to try to work with those property owners. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to some comment cards uh, that are in this box. I'm, I've gone through them not to pick easy ones versus hard ones. There are a couple of hard ones in here, but because some of them were already answered uh, in the discussion. And I'd, I'd ask that not all three of you comment on each one. So point to the person you think is most expert in answering it, and we'll see if you all agree in the same thing. Uh, the first is from Tim Carr. How is Miami Beach planning to use more uh, permeable surfaces and pavers to improve resiliency and decrease water runoff into our storm sewers and bay? Who do you think, uh, Jimmy, who do you think should answer that? <laughs> okay. And former public works director could have a better sense of that. Um, we are absolutely looking at every opportunity to improve the amount of water that recharges into the ground that doesn't end up in our stormwater system. That's really the whole concept of the blue and green infrastructure that we're asking Jacobs to give us some best practices on how to handle, whether it be introduction of pavers, um, whether it be utilizing our park space for co-benefits. Um, you know, one of the, I know Tim happens to be uh, a resident of the Bentley Bay and, and has been in conversations with us about the pump station at 6th Street. One of the concepts that we really want to see incorporated and are working on incorporating into the 6th Street Park is a water retention area underneath the park so that that first flush of rainfall that comes in or any of these smaller storms that we get hit with, we can move the water into that green space and it can percolate into the ground and recharge our freshwater lens, which is critical for the survival of all of our landscaping here in the city. You know, one of the things people love about Miami Beach besides our Art Deco buildings are the lush landscaping that we have. Um, and, and it really does make this place a paradise. We need to make sure that we keep those things vibrant. Thank you. Okay, this is from Lauren Lipkin, and I know Lauren has asked this question to me and to many others, and it's really about the seaweed and so, so, um, the Sargassum seaweed issue. What are we doing to address uh, the seaweed? Or, or are summers in Miami Beach ruined forever? And I, and I think a lot of people have asked about it, and, and I don't know if the city's had an exactly the same answer because I think the situation has changed a little bit and maybe some of the options. Jimmy, I know yeah, we've talked about it. In fact, I, I had a meeting today with um, County Commissioner Eileen Higgins and her staff and park staff for the county, as many of you know, east of the dunes, um, I mean, the state owns the beach technically, but they basically work uh, with the county to provide the maintenance, including dealing with seaweed removal. Interestingly, the seaweed removal, per not removal, treatment permits are actually issued week by week. That's how closely the state monitors those issues and its concerns with not overreacting to it. 
There's no question that in the last three or four years, all over the Caribbean, we have seen a significant increase uh, in the amount of seaweed coming out of the Sargassum Sea and uh, you know, all up and down the coast. They have it all the way up into the mid-Atlantic areas as well. Um, and we're seeing it obviously along Miami Beach. We've got about 15 miles of beaches in, in Dade County, half of them are Miami Beach. The county's uh, strategy to date is to what uh, they call blade the uh, seaweed to the shoreline and then cover it with sand and then allow essentially the, 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 uh, the tide to take it out or continue it buried uh, under the sand, not to remove it. The, the challenges there are, uh, number one, it's a significant amount. They estimate probably up and down the beaches of Day County, so whatever number I give, probably take half from Miami Beach, you're talking about 60,000 cubic yards of seaweed a day, um, which, would, uh, which would require probably about 1,400 truck trips to take it off the beach to landfills that charge anywhere from $500 to $1,000 uh, per truck. The, in order to remove that seaweed, you would probably have to have portions of the beach closed throughout the day because there's too high tides. So at this point, I don't believe they, they believe that removal is a, a reasonable option. Uh, but they're, they're, we're actually going to be having a presentation at the Neighborhoods Committee, I think on June 19th. They've put together a very good presentation. They're going to talk about um, some of the you know, misconceptions about seaweed. I've seen emails that it's bad for the sea turtles. In fact, the little turtles go out to the Sargassum Sea to grow and feed on the, uh, uh, the animals beneath it. Um, the, the seaweed is not toxic. Uh, if it goes back onto the water, that's often what the, 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 the master plan is uh, and considered best practices by um, the DEP and, and Durham. So but they're going to be uh, at the June 19th meeting. This is really in their jurisdiction, uh, and, um, and they're going to be presenting on June 19th. They're working on um, a communications plan and to provide some alternatives. But it, uh, removal, which is really not done, uh, not favored uh, by the state, uh, is a very expensive proposition and one that is highly burdensome to the environment. Um, and it would impact, um, I think, the residents and, and visitors' enjoyment of the beach. Thank you for that. Um, uh, okay, this next question is from Roger Shields. What is being done uh, to motivate waterfront property owners to bring their seawalls up to code and condition? Who do we have that's going to answer that? I don't know if anybody. We, well, a couple of things. We did, um, with the interesting thing, just to point out, uh, Eric, we've got, I think, about 60 miles of seawalls in, in, in Miami Beach, but only, I think, three or four miles of those are public. And so, um, it's a very good question to ask, and we've looked at some options and alternatives, and uh, I know, Susie, you've looked at the insurance side, um, but that is a, a great question because the overwhelming uh, majority of our seawalls are in private hands, and the long-term solution has to involve their capacity to do so. If you guys want to go to Jeff. Yeah, if, if I could, um, I mean, the easy thing for, for any government to do is to, is to pass legislation that requires people when they build new or when they do a substantial upgrade to their home, they need to bring their seawall up to the, the latest requirements. Um, what we're also doing is we're evaluating the seawalls on a citywide basis to see whether or not we have some potential gaps in the smile, so to speak. Um, areas where there might be a handful of walls that are lower that would put the entire area at risk. Um, and then once we've identified those, then we could potentially take a more proactive approach to dealing with some of those, um, you know, high risk, high reward uh, type situations. I'll, I'll just quickly add that we do have an interdisciplinary team because that's really the fashion in which we're working now. Uh, it's being led by our chief financial officer, um, the resilience team, engineering. We're looking at what are the options for those private seawalls. And I know it's, it is a commission priority, and we've been tasked to look at um, are there different financing options? Uh, are there different uh, methods that can be done? So we're trying to figure out kind of an assessment and then potential financing options. Um, to deal with this very complex matter. Yeah, we've looked at, uh, a couple years ago, Rockefeller Foundation came in. This was pre-100RC. Figuring out whether they could do it through an insurance discount program that would help pay for it if the numbers didn't work. Um, most recently, we've been looking at, I think, what is it, that Y Green and other efforts that allow you to put some of your home improvement costs on your tax bill. 
as a way to help folks pay it. Uh, but unfortunately, the state right now is not allowing those programs to uh, uh, use that, pro um, that mechanism for resilient efforts, including seawalls. So that's part of our lobbying effort, but for now, that tool is not available. Maybe it will if we are successful in our lobbying. Okay. Uh, the next uh, two questions I've sort of combined. One is from uh, Bob Princeton and Marvin Logan, uh, and the other is from Tom Harrington. They both deal with sort of pollution. Uh, uh, Bob sort of asks, why is Miami Beach continuing to pollute Biscayne Bay? And Tom, at the end of one of his questions, he asks, speak to the porous limestone base in the contamination of our aquifer from salt water. These are pretty specific questions, and a lot of people do wonder whether these new technologies, uh, moving to a pumped system from a gravitational system, is increasing the pollution. Uh, talk about that. I've seen some of the videos that people have sent us showing stuff coming out of our outlays, uh, and I don't know who's, I'm suspecting that Eric might be the first point of departure on this, but I certainly think it's an important enough issue where anyone ought to hear, ought to weigh in. Sure. Um, the bottom line is Miami Beach has more than 300 outfalls um, already in place that have been in place since the original development of the city. Um, those outfalls had zero treatment associated with them. It was anything that fell on the street went into the storm drain system and went out these outfalls into the bay. Um, our systems that we're installing now actually have a four-step treatment process that removes a substantial amount of any pollutants that may be in that stormwater. But the most effective way to deal with stormwater pollution is to regulate it at the source. And that's asking the folks not to put as much fertilizer on their lawn that might run off into the stormwater system. Um, to do the street sweeping operations that we do and have been um, recognized by the state as being one of the leaders in managing our street sweeping program, um, doing the cleaning of the stormwater system with greater frequency than any other municipality that I'm aware of. Uh, and we've been recognized for those things. So what we're trying to do is intercept everything before it gets to the bay uh, so that whatever is being discharged is, you know, I don't want to say a number, but my guess would be probably 20 to 50 times cleaner than what may have been going out before. Um, and in reality, we're 300 outfalls of the nearly 8,000 outfalls countywide that are going into Biscayne Bay. I think where we should spend our time is helping the other municipalities that aren't doing everything that we're doing get up to speed with where we are so that the greater bay could benefit from these best practices. I can just chime in as well that part of the resilient strategy that's going to be released on Thursday is um, creating uh, opportunities to work regionally on this issue. And, and to what Eric is mentioning, that we're not the only ones discharging into the bay. And stormwater isn't pretty. You don't want to walk around barefoot in it. You don't want to be around it. What we have to do is really up our environmental efforts and, and really uh, our pollution and our cleanup efforts. And in addition to everything Eric mentioned, you know, also curb your dog and, and, you know, don't litter and things like that. The cleaner we can keep our city, the cleaner we can keep our system in our bay. One other thing I want to highlight, and, and Susie, you may have more details. I don't think there's a city in South Florida, maybe all of Florida, that does as much water quality testing as we've done. We have, I think, several dozen sites across the city where we engage in at least, I think, a year-long monitoring of our water quality. Uh, and contrary to a lot of what's said out there, uh, there was no perceptible difference between pump, uh, outfalls that had pumped water and outfalls that just had gravity. It's the same water. water. It's the same it's, water. It's the same water. Um, you know, stormwater, and I, I want to highlight, stormwater is never a good thing because it's cleaning streets out. It's cleaning, you know, animal feces uh, in parks and beaches. Most people will tell you don't swim after a big storm. In fact, oftentimes when we have, uh, you know, uh, watches or warnings at the beach, it's often after a big storm has washed a lot of stuff into it. So no stormwater is clean. And as I pointed out, and if you ever see the pictures, even just the solid stuff, the number of bottles and cans 
that would go into the bay. If you swim out, I remember one time I was out with the um, public works guys, if you swim out like 50 feet from some of the outfalls, it's covered in cans and bottles from what used to come out of there. So um, it is so much cleaner. We, we can do better, but, it, but regionally, it would be like us with a micro, you know, uh, dropping uh, micro drops when you've got county, sometimes occasionally leaking sanitary sewer into the bay like they had a huge leak a few months ago. Uh, it is a regional problem and it requires a regional solution. Thank you. Uh, last question, I can do one more question. So uh, this is a, an email from Alejandro uh, Balacello. Uh, and it has to do, it asks, does the panel believe that climate change has negatively impacted property values in Miami Beach? If not, does the panel project that it will be negatively affected in the future by continued climate change? If so, when and by how much? And I guess this just goes to the idea, and I think it's a really important concept. It's costly, it can be disruptive. Um, what's it going to affect the assets of our community uh, individually and collectively? You know, I, if I, you want to start on that. I do, end. because this question really bothers me. Because um, I, I get this a lot, and I, I speak at a lot of panels. And, um, and, and different audiences. And when, when I hear things like that, w we haven't seen any real proof. Uh, we have seen some studies, but even those studies, uh, we can poke holes at them. And so what we're seeing is a lot of speculation. And I think speculation is very dangerous. Um, I, I'd rather live in a city that's investing in infrastructure than in a city who's letting their infrastructure age and, and die. And, and so, I, I'd, I'd rather look at this problem as a problem that can be managed, and it's a, and it's a problem that we can uh, be smart and invest in our city and protect ourselves and reduce our risk over time. And what that means is, you know, I always say that there's going to be another generation of mayors, managers, engineers, and, and ACMs that will build upon what this generation did. So I have not seen any evidence of that uh, as of yet. And, and again, I would argue that um, I'd rather be in a city that has their eyes open to the vulnerabilities and the risk and is adapting to it and is adapting incrementally over time and looking for you know, the next generation to add to what we did. Um, yeah, I mean, I am a firm believer in the human spirit can overcome just about anything. I mean, look at what Miami Beach was built from it was built out of the ocean by raising it up from a mangrove swamp to this wonderful, vibrant city that we have today. I have no doubt that with cooperation and continued support, we can continue to adapt and, and evolve to an even greater city by overcoming these challenges. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, I, I don't think there's been much of any impact. Um, it's, it's sort of a paradox. We've been the poster child for climate change now probably for six, seven years, and yet, um, you know, you had a hotel recently sold for $1.4 million a key and, and whatnot. So I, I don't think we've seen that impact. Part of it, I think, is, you know, sometimes to some degree, real estate investments take a more short-term view than, than they should. But, but I think part of it is what we're doing. I mean, what we're doing not just as, as a city. You know, we have a Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce that has been very proactive on the issue of resiliency. We have a lot of developers who were you know, putting forward projects that are very in investing in blue and green infrastructure. Um, I think we have uh, actually, as ULI said, we should embrace resiliency really as our brand in a sense. We are a city that is challenged, but, but is facing those challenges. And I think that has restored some faith, certainly in the bondholders, I think in, in the real estate investment. And I think we just need to continue to do that. You know, uh, uh, are we gonna look the same in 50 years as we look today? Probably not, but then, that's, you know, I think the whole world is facing that. And I think human beings are adaptable. And the, the world doesn't look like it looked like 2,000 years ago. And Susie and I were talking. She just got back from a vacation in Rome. And, and you, if anyone's been to Rome, you, you know, every layer you dig in is a different level of Rome. Cities have built upon themselves and changed. And, and I think Miami Beach will be no different. So that was the last question. Let me just say a quick thing. Uh, time to bring it to an end. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. And thank uh, the three of you for it. Let's hear it for our um, contestants. <laughs> Uh, let me just let me just say this. Um, you know, I, I believe this is an entirely surmountable challenge. That's the word I use because I don't think um, I don't think the sky is falling. I think we have to make serious decisions informed with science 
We have to have political will. But by the way, our bond rating was just AA plus. We just got upgraded uh, by the flood insurance folks who said, you're less of a risk than you were before. So it's, so the people, I mean, I, I always joke, the manager can say we're resilient, but if a bank or a actuary says otherwise, it doesn't really matter what you say. But the, the credit agencies and the folks that have to insure perils realize that we're doing the right stuff. But it doesn't happen of us telling the community this is what we're gonna do. The truth of the matter is everybody has to be in this together. I, most of the things I do as mayor are gonna be implemented by when, when some other mayor is here. Uh, and maybe when you know two or three mayors down the road. And we've got to have that long-term view, but we also have to be open-eyed. We have to be transparent. The burden on us is to answer your questions. And the burden on you is to want to be informed. Because uh, when you don't have an informed constituency, everything goes, you know, every, everything goes downhill. And we want everybody to be informed and we want to talk. And the, one of the reasons we're going about it this way is we think together we're really going to we're going to be able to, uh, to navigate this quite nicely, and we're going to continue to have a community we love living in and is secure uh, in every way, including um, the assets that we love and the people that we love. So thank you for coming. Is there anything else that more needs to be said? Somebody from management is coming. <laughs> okay. I would like to personally thank all of you for being here. Mayor, thank you so much for moderating this. I did want to say that I appreciate the way that we did the questions tonight because I think it's so important that so often, so, so many people aren't able to ask the questions that they may have wanted to ask when you only take a couple questions from the audience. We love the tough questions and we appreciate that we did the questions this way. So we vow to go through those questions and to work with the panelists and work with city staff and do our best to answer the questions that you have submitted. I encourage you all to visit MB Rising Above Dot com. That's the city's portal, and that's where you're going to find a lot of information. Read the magazine front to back. I really do hope that you use it as a tool to educate yourself on the resilience efforts of the city. And if you have any questions that weren't answered tonight, aren't answered in the magazine, and aren't answered on the portal, please email feedback at miamibeachfl.gov. And again, thank you all very much for coming tonight.